Welcome Home Go, inspiring you to find ways to serve, engage, and make a difference. Making it easier for you to find hope in your busy world. Our original production on Good Life 45, where hope happens. Make a difference. Hi, everyone. I'm Barbara Beck, and I want to thank you for tuning in to Welcome Home Go, 30 minutes of discussions on challenging topics that will inspire you to go make a difference. This shorter version, a spinoff of Welcome Home, was created because we know you're super busy. So we've made it even easier for you to find hope, to grow in your faith walk, and then go and make a difference in this challenging world of ours. You'll still get the same meaningful, inspiring discussions on topics that we believe Jesus would want us to respond to by serving wherever we're called. Our focus on Welcome Home, Go is to encourage you to find ways to serve that fit your lifestyle and your set of God-given gifts. These next few minutes together, let's listen and learn how to mobilize our families, our friends, our people, and do something to make a difference in someone's life. Maybe it's just one person, but go, serve, be the hands and feet of Jesus, and enjoy with me now. Welcome home, Go. Make a difference. Hey viewers, if you ever needed encouragement in your life, today's the day that you're going to be receiving it. I just remet William Andrews and he has already blessed my life so tremendously and so joyously and he loves the Lord and just hearing his story of ashes to beauty is going to bless your heart give you the kind of encouragement that we need to be able to live those abundant lives in Christ that Jesus prepared for us so I am honored deeply deeply honored today to introduce you to I'm gonna call him pastor and now my friend my brother in Christ William Andrews thank you so much for being here with us today Oh, no, you're more than welcome. It's my honor, my pleasure. Thank you, sir. How tall are you, first of all? Six eight. You're you're kind of a big guy, <clears throat> right? Tall guy. Yes, I am. What did they call you? Didn't they have a kind of nickname for you? Well, when I was living on the streets, they called me six nine. That's it, six nine. Six yeah. nine. But you're not on the streets anymore. But I want our viewers to hear about the ashes before we get to the beauty, because you did live like a, a wasted life in a lot of ways until God <sighs> redeemed you. Yes, it yes? was from ninety two to ninety seven. I lived on the streets of Orlando. I went through every bunk house, our house, crack house, mm. uh, you name it. Those that's that was my travels yeah. until one day, you know, I'm asking God to change my life and asking God to take drugs away from me. I'm literally, I'm begging God. Mm -hmm. And I told God sitting behind the Salvation Army by the water fountain, the water that comes up yeah. in that little pool, I'm begging God and I, t and I told God, if you don't take the taste of drugs away from me, I'm going to die out here. And I remember I heard I felt the presence of God in a way where it was said to me, how can I take something from you you won't give me? Mm. And that changed my whole perspective wow. in terms of recovery, getting yeah. off drugs, because yeah. the reality of it is, and faith, it's up to you to allow God to take, yeah. the, to give it to God, then allow him yes. to give you the power and the strength to stay away from it. Yeah. So in asking God to take it and God saying to me, I can't take something from you. You won't give me. You give have to, to surrender me. it. Yeah. So I'm not you heard take that. It. You heard that almost audibly or in your spirit? No, I heard it audibly you in did? my ear. Yeah. And then the second time I literally heard the voice of God was I was praying at a church called Center Church of the Nazarene, which was downtown Orlando, one block away from First Press. Mm. And I used to sleep at First Press oh, wow. in that doorway, yeah. the restoration oh. uh, chapel. And I heard the Lord as I was in the prayer room, three men prayed over me, Bill Austin, Greg Mills, and Carl Jacobs. I literally heard the Lord say, you will never do drugs again, and you're going to be my servant. Praise God. <laughs> it's a funny <laughs> thing, Bible. I didn't pray to be no pastor. I really didn't. Yeah. And when God came into my life, being a pastor, serving him, wasn't my idea. But that's what I heard that I would be his servant. And I ended up in a drug rehab center for 26 months right here in Orlando. Mm. And I stayed there and 
The, the process of deliverance is it, it, it's strange in a way because you can be instantly delivered from something, but you have to go through the process of deliverance to come to the point of sanctification, and that takes time. What does that look like, that process? Was it painful? Was it, were there days that you wanted to say, this is too hard, I want to go back? There's a lot of days like that. Uh, the process, it basically starts out with what we call in our denomination, prevenient grace. Mm -hmm. And the prevenient grace is the grace that goes before grace. And you may have heard it this way, I should be dead, I shouldn't have yeah. made it. Yeah. Evidently God has a purpose yeah. for me. And that's how it started with me. The seeds were planted and I was in a Catholic school from eight to 16, wow. a private Catholic school as a juvenile. And all of that began to come back. And when I recover, I ended up at Central Care Mission. You might have heard of that. Yeah. I ended up there, stayed 26 months. And while I was there, mm. I had to deal with all of the baggage that I was dealing with. I had to deal with all the facts of the things that the nuns had told me that I didn't learn, didn't pay attention to. I wanted to be a, uh, a Dominican priest when I was there. Mm. I was studying. I knew all the Latin that the nuns had taught me, other mass and was studying Latin. I knew all the history of the church, but I let all that go when I left there and had to go back to the projects. And when I went back to the projects, by the time I left the Catholic school, which was a Polish school that the Pope Pius X had gave to the nuns exceeded the land in New Britain, Connecticut, and they had this land and they were really was called the Polish orphanage. Mm. And they had all of these kids from Krakow, Poland, mm. after the World War II had went through the Blitzkrieg Mm -hmm. And so the nuns couldn't afford it to run it as an orphanage no more, so they took in state wards. And I was the first state ward wow. and the, you know, to ever wow. go to that school. And it happened through the juvenile system of Hartford, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. When I got there, the nuns fell in love with me and they were mm -hmm. determined to save my dark soul. Mm -hmm. I became their little chocolate baby. Were you the only one that was an African-American? I African -American? was the only African-American mm -hmm. there among 200 kids. Wow. And I stayed there from age eight to 16. So I learned everything yeah. there was to know about God. So you had the foundation. I had the foundation, but it was gone. So when I started recovering, the first thing that came back was everything they was teaching me. Good. I remember uh, going to a crack house and I was begging God. This, I begged God all, along the whole way of getting off it. I'm going to a crack house and a car drives by and on the back of the car I had a, a one of those signs that say, uh, two, uh, no, real men pray, real mm. men love God. Mm. I'm trying to get off it, I'm begging God, person runs by and on a t-shirt say, I'm too blessed to be stressed. Yeah. Every feeding program wow. I go to, they, you know, Jesus loves you. Yeah. And you have to hear a message first before you get the food. Yeah. So I'm being bombarded with all of this so that by the time I told God that I would serve him and I'm going through the process of deliverance at Central Care Mission. I'm dealing with all of this. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I'm dealing with also the temptations of what the enemy's trying to do yeah. to draw me back out. Yeah. And so the process is that God can deliver you, but you have to overcome, you have to overcome whatever it is that's a stronghold in your life. And that's what I had to deal with. Let me ask you this, William. What a story, first of all. What a story. Six, eight to 18, eight to 16, you're in this Catholic school. You're learning about the Lord. You're learning spiritual principles. You're not doing drugs then. No. Right? You're leading a fairly disciplined life at that point. When you got out at 16, is that when it happened that you went to drugs? Or when did it happen and why did you go to drugs? Well, when I got out, I had to move back to the projects. Where were the projects? In Hartford, Connecticut, In Bellevue Connecticut. Square. It was the okay. first housing project that HUD was experimenting with in New England. And so there was 52 buildings and each building had five stories and each building had 20 apartments. Wow. And so I lived in those projects. So when I left, I hung out. That's how I got there, because I was in trouble as a juvenile. Okay. So when I came back, I was trying to get back in. Well, do you think, would you say, William, that at some point after you were in, the, you were in rehab for the 26 months, 
when did you really come to know Jesus personally? Because it's one thing to learn about him, you know, in our heads. You had great knowledge, and that's a good foundation. We have to start somewhere. But at some point, Jesus went from your head to your heart, right? Was that during rehab, or when did you start to have a relationship with Jesus? I would say about the end of the first year, okay. I called home. And I had found out that my mother had died. Mm. And I asked my sister, how did she die? She said, a broken heart. She said, because oh. you wasn't there. Wow. And wow. mom had done everything for you. Mm. It took, and my family was really upset with me because I never kept in touch with them. I've always been on the run. I worked in labor camps in North Carolina. I just ran. I'd been across the country four or five times, and everywhere I went, I ended up running. And my family was disappointed, and so they kind of turned on me, but I told them that I had changed. I'm in the rehab center, and I told them I had changed. And so one of the process of rehab in terms of apologizing or asking for forgiveness was that I had to learn that what I was doing was not that person they knew. And right. so it, it, it came to the point where it had to be proven. Yeah, yeah. And I met my fiance, and my fiance kind of like really encouraged me and encouraged me, and, and she became my wife named Rosie, and she encouraged me to the point where it was almost like either you're going to do this or we're not going to get married because you need to have your family support. Mm -hmm. So I got in touch with my family, and, and my sister told me this, and this is at this point, she said, you're a Christian? I said, yes, I gave my life to Christ. She said, well, if you're a Christian, you're going to pay me back my money. And so my wife <laughs> made me set up a budget where I had to send her money every week. But in the process of doing that, and I remember one time, I didn't want to do it because we were tight on money, but I literally heard the Lord say, I got you. Mm. Send the money. Mm -hmm. And I send the money, and Jerry Appleby, who I was by this time at the uh, Central Care was I was working at Restore Orlando. Yeah. And I ended up becoming the senior pastor there and served a period of time as a, a director. I served on the board of directors. And um, he told me, he said, that the district wants you to plant a church. And I didn't have district license or anything, but I was on a fast track. And, and the whole time that this has happened, and re reuniting with my family, mm -hmm. Uh, moving ahead as a pastor without all of the finished qualifications. And uh, I, I just knew that it was God that yes. had my back. Absolutely. And everything began to change. Yeah. And I began to see a change in my life. The struggle was still there, but I, it, was, it was a confidence and assurance of the fact that he was with me because things mm -hmm. were changing. Mm -hmm. So you never did go back to drugs. After your mm -hmm. 26 months, after all that time, you were, you were clean. I was clean, okay. and, and I was ready. Yeah. And after the 26 months, I ended up becoming a local, a minister with a local license, which only allowed me to be in local churches. And then they asked me to plant a church, and so I had to get a district license. And God had already, uh, everything that happened in my life and where I wanted to go, it was here, but I had to travel from A to B. Yes. And yes. so this is one of the things I tell the uh, people in the church. Your life, God's plan is already there. You're the one that has to travel through the valley of the shadow of death. But you have to remember this, at the end, there's a light because God has already prepared everything. That's right. And that's all biblical when you read scripture. Right. It wasn't by accident that Moses went to the wilderness. It wasn't by accident in the wilderness he saw the burning bush and God sent him to Egypt. And it wasn't by accident of the whole Bible and relationship when you're reading it, you can see God's hand yes. at work. Yes. And I saw that God showed it to me. He said, if I did all of this, what makes you think I'm not going to do it for you? Wow. So I don't worry about anything. Right. I try not to, you know, just still the struggle. Sure. That's my struggle sure. now. William, we're going to take a little break. When we come back, we're going to talk to you about what you're doing now on Mercy Drive. William has an incredible ministry where he is ministering to those kids, those youth who are probably a little bit marginalized. And he's knowing because of firsthand experience how to deal with these guys and girls and just what an incredible ministry he has. So he's gone from ashes to beauty. We've talked about the ashes. When we get back, you're going to hear a beautiful, beautiful story. So stay with us. We'll be right back. Go make a difference. 
Welcome back, viewers. I know that you're enjoying our program today. This is an incredible story, William Andrews and his journey from ashes to beauty. He's been telling us about what it was like to live on the streets, to go through rehabilitation for 26 months, and to now have an incredible ministry where he is impacting who knows how many young people for the Lord. William, thank you again for being here with us Welcome. today. Let's talk about what God is doing now in and through you. You're a pastor of, what's the name of your church? The Heart of Mercy Community Church. Okay. And what are you doing there? And to well, whom are you? Are you the, the lead pastor, the head pastor? Yes. Okay, so you're preaching every week. Every week. Okay. Um, what we're doing now is that we started a school, but when we first got there, we didn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. And so we were praying and asking God to send people uh, across our path, that not only with words of encouragement, but people we would be able to partner with. And we tried everybody, United Methodist Church up on Fairbanks, Winter Park uh, uh, Theater, uh, I mean, just church after church, trying to figure out. Then my wife had a vision, and the vision was she saw a bunch of kids getting off the school bus mm. and coming to the church. And so what had happened is that the school system about five years ago eliminated uh, transportation for kids from Mercy Drive to the Ivory Lane School because they said they were within the two-mile distance of the school. So the kids would eventually would have to have walked across uh, Colonial, mm. and then walk across Old Winter Garden Road. Mm. So we offered our bus Good. and was going to donate Good. the bus to the district to be able to transport the kids. They said they couldn't take it. They couldn't do it because of liability reasons. So we took, so we, okay, we set up a system where we would trans, uh, transport the kids and we told the families that we would charge $5 a week per family, no matter how many kids you had on the bus. So we quickly learned, we ended up with 75 kids. Wow. We quickly learned that we didn't have the capacity yeah. to fulfill that. So we went down to 40, then eventually to 30. And so when we went down to 30, we charged $30 a month, which was basically $1 a day, and if you had two, it was 50 cents a day. But the other half of the program fees was you had to be involved in a budgeting class, a, a coupon class, uh, a parenting class, so we made the program fees as low as we can. So the classes it's, were for the kids or for the parents? The classes were uh, the the classes was for the parents, but the transportation, the mentoring. Kids. Yes. Yeah, we we were transporting the kids. We were mentoring the kids. We were uh, providing snacks for the kids. Wow. Three field trips a year, mm. and provided Christmas party with Robinson and Bush Insurance Company mm. and First Press. We provided, uh, we would recruit families to take a family and just take care of that family wow. for, uh, for Christmas and for Thanksgiving. Yeah. And so all of that we were doing for a dollar, $30 yeah. a month. Crazy. And so uh, then after five years, because I drove the bus the first three years. Mm -hmm. I had to be there all the time, and uh, then the board of directors said we need to hire a bus driver. So we end up with the last two years just hiring a bus driver. So when the system changed for the Board of Education where the kids on Mercy Drive would now go to Rock Lake, uh, Lady Lake, and so we started a early learning development center for our kids because we were finding out that a lot of our kids by the time they got to preschool and elementary, they were already Ready behind. behind. Mm -hmm. And so what we want to do was to pick up and, and uh, step in and right. that. Accelerate that. So, that. so tell me, is that working? Are, are they able to catch up and to, to be where the other kids are? Well, we, this is our first year, so oh, okay. when they haven't come to the end okay. of the year to be able to measure it. Got it. So some of the things that we're doing now, though, we're partnering with various other churches. Good, good. And we learned through that process that we need to take the lead on it because historically, the black church has always been the leader in the community through the civil rights period, whatever issue there was. The black church has always been there, but I think that there are things that are happening now where that dynamic is changing. Mm -hmm. And so it's hard to get young people in there. So we're trying to, first of all, get young people involved in trusting God. Because I found out through my own story that if the heart doesn't change, mm -hmm. nothing will change. Right. 
And if you get people involved in trusting and believing in God, then they will make the difference in the community. Yeah. And that's the reason why one of the things we also do is that we try to provide ministry to help people to trust God, to help them to get off entitlement rather than mm -hmm. wait for a program on the 1st or the 15th or whatever the government's mm -hmm. doing that they are able to do it themselves. Mm -hmm. And so is it a tough journey? Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Getting people to let go of something that's a guarantee in some aspects, but anybody in Tallahassee, Washington can wake up tomorrow and say, let's cut it. Mm -hmm. And so it's what true. we want people to do is to trust God, step mm -hmm. out on their own, believing in their gift and talents, and move forward. Mm, wait, but that's wonderful. Part of the process is that you have to bite the bullet, you have yeah. to budget your bunny, you have yeah. to, you know, make sacrifices. But you feel like you're making positive strides. Or are you discouraged? Because sometimes I see in your face like this is so hard. It, it is hard. And there are times there is discouragement, but every now and then my wife and I sitting in a, a restaurant. And somebody would come and say, Pastor Andrews, I know you don't know me, but mm. I was in your class. Wow. And my life has Good. changed. Good. And it's always at a time when I'm at my lowest point. Yeah. And I'm God thinking, brings that to you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, you look at your life. You know, you were one life. That, that Jesus changed that one life. And look how many people you're influencing. And I, and I don't even think that you can possibly know how many people you're touching through the years with your, your kind of a ministry. And I do pray, William, that you won't get discouraged because, I mean, the, everybody, everybody needs an advocate. Everybody needs somebody out there who's believing in them and helping them, whether they grab hold it or not. Look what you did years later. You look back on those nuns who were trying to teach you the truth of Jesus. So you are planting so many seeds along the way. And I don't want you to, to think that it's all for naught because you're doing an amazing thing. I mean, you have touched my life just in visiting with us together and looking at your video and just, just talking to you. You are a man of God who is making an incredible impact on the kingdom. So I just, I thank you for that. And, and, I, and again, I mean, I'd love to hear a success story or two that you have because I, I know they're out there. I know those kids are coming to you in the restaurant, but, but is there somebody in particular that you've seen that you thought, oh man, this was me, you know, 30 years ago, this kid was me and now look at him or her. Yeah, is there anybody like that? Yes. The, the, the way you put it, there, it's, I could say there's a bunch of them, yeah. but it's not a bunch. Okay. It's like maybe eight or nine that have come to me. And let me just give you one illustration. I was serving as a minister at Reese Orlando and I coached the basketball team. And Kendrick, this is the guy, I was really depressed. I was considering resigning from mm. my position from the denomination and become a non-denominational church. And I remember he came to the house and knocked on the door. I opened the door and I had been pastor and minister in this church for three years. I opened the door and he said, pastor, and that was the first time, because everybody, all the kids called me coach. They all knew I was pastor. They'd been to the church. And he, he said, Pastor, can I talk to you? Wow. And I remember I walked back in the room, and my wife said, who's that? I said, it's Kendra. So she said, why are you crying? I said, he called me pastor. Oh. There's been some first in my life that God has given to me that allowed me to be able to reach back into that well and, and draw something out that just, I, I, yeah, well, everybody in the church say I'm a crier, but, <laughs> but, but sometimes the well is dry. Mm -hmm. And God has given, I'll, I'll never forget sitting behind Salvation Army. I can't take what you won't give me. Yeah. I remember that. I remember hearing yeah. it clearly. I remember the prayer inside the prayer room. You're go they're not going to do drugs. They're going to be my son. I remember the voice of Kendra when he said, Pastor. Mm -hmm. I remember that. And, and I remember the young guy that came to me in a restaurant, Pastor, I was in your class. See, what you're doing, William, is 
I mean, people can have hope because you can say, oh, there's hope. There's hope for you in life and you can do all kinds of things. But what you're doing that is the difference is that you're pointing them to the hope in Jesus. It's not just things are going to get better. <clears throat> you know, our political system will get better. We're going to we're going to vote in the right guy and the right woman and everything's going to get better. It's not going to get better until there's a change of the heart. Right. And that's what you're directing them to without that. That's why I love the pastor story. You're not just a coach. You're a pastor. And you're changing lives and you're allowing them to see Jesus in you. Man, I see it in you. When I look at you and I see your heart and I see the tears that come, you are a man of God. And, and we're almost out of time. But I want to give you 30 seconds to just speak to some youth out there, speak to some parents, some grandparents, and just give them a little piece of advice. The biggest lesson maybe that you've learned, something that can encourage that person today who is discouraged. For all the parents that are praying for their children that have asked me to talk to their children. Let me just say this. The prevenient grace God keeping a surrounding hedge of protection about their life only proves that God has something for them. Your responsibility is to continue to keep water in the sea, but the increase will come from God. And when you pray, you pray it with a confidence of knowing that God it will always fulfill his promise. If you seek him first, I promise you, all the other things will be added unto you. I promise you that. I, my life says it, my life proves it, that if you seek him first in his righteousness, it is God's responsibility to add all the other things. I promise you, you will receive it. Just trust him, believe in him, and continue to move forward. Let God handle it. Pastor, Pastor William Andrews, thank you. God thank bless you, you. Love you dearly. Uh, viewers, I, I told you so. I told you you were going to get a blessing today. Uh, this is an incredible man of God and a story going from ashes being on the streets, could have died on the streets as a homeless person, to one of beauty where he's affecting lives for the kingdom and just uh, touching so many people. Whether he touched you today or not, I know that he touched my life. And um, so grateful to God for bringing him across our path today. And one more little thing of interest here. I know we're almost out of time. I want to, to tell you that William married my daughter's brother-in-law. He and his wife were married by this man of God many years. How many years ago? 15 years yeah, ago? 15. It's been quite a while. So we're grateful to God for your influence, for your being a great pastor and a man of God. Uh, so I hope that you enjoyed this portion of our show. Again, I know that I did. Hope you were encouraged. More coming up, so stay with us. Make a difference. Powerful words and discussions, even challenging in a lot of ways, right? Well, it certainly makes me want to re-examine my own priorities. I want to make sure that everything I'm doing is in line with God's will for my life, being involved in ministries and activities that are pleasing to my Father, and never just spinning my wheels. Well, I know you're super busy, and here at Good Life 45, we want to serve you in the best ways we can and make it even easier for you to find hope in this challenging world. That's why our focus on Welcome Home Go is to encourage you to find ways to serve that fit your lifestyle and your set of God-given gifts. Friends, we need to be learning, applying our hearts to instruction, finding ways to be winsome to the world, but then going out and serving like Jesus would do. He would go and serve others. That's our calling. God's going to use you in ways you can't even imagine. So keep learning and growing, but take another step. You don't have to go across the ocean. Like the program you just saw, we want to share countless examples of ways you can change people's lives right here, right now. Go. Just make a difference in someone's life. And that's it for today. Thanks so much for watching Welcome Home Go. I hope to see you out there, and God bless you. You just watched Welcome Home Go, a Goodbye 45 original production that makes you part of our hope team here on Goodbye 45, where hope happens. Thank you.